Good morning, church. It's Sunday, April 19th. I know we're all ready to be out and ready to be able to come together and worship and praise our God together and see each other. Uh, but we're blessed and grateful for the opportunity to continue to broadcast our services to you until such time as we can meet again. We hope that you're encouraged by our worship this morning, and uh, we want to thank all of you who are tuning in for the first time, and we hope that you'll be able to come and see us and visit us when we can come meet together again. We have a lot of things going on in our service this morning. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to have an opportunity to take communion. We're going to have a lesson, and then we're going to have a word from one of our elders but before we do all that, we're going to have a children's message that Brother J.P. Twasson is going to bring to us. And then we're going to have a prayer and a scripture before we sing. So we'll turn things over to J.P. Love is like a lucky penny. Hold it tight or you won't have any. Give it away and you'll have plenty. You'll end up having more. Hi, boys and girls. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. Hi, Emma. Hi, Mia. Hi. Today, what is this in front of you? What is that? Silver and gold. Silver and gold. Yeah. What, what can you get with silver and gold? Do you know? Bracelets. Bracelets. Candy. Candy. And ice cream. Ice cream. Treasure boxes. Yeah. And dresses and and glass slippers. And you and can get braces. as many of that as you want also if you have plenty of gold and silver. Do you know what is worth more than gold and silver? God and Jesus. <laughs> yes, so God's word uh, is more than gold and silver. Today, Proverbs 16, 16, it states, it reads, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. So the things that you can buy with silver and gold can only last for a certain time, right? But with God's word, yeah, that will endure forever. That will also help you to avoid certain pitfalls or dangers or uh, things that can cause you harm in the future. Okay, so we need to strive to get God's word and learn it and to keep it in our hearts, okay? So here, why don't you fold your hand, close your eyes, and pray with me. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for blessing us with one another. And Father God, thank you for blessing us with your word. Help us to learn it. Help us to keep it in our hearts. And help us, Father, to be obedient to it. Thank you so much for sending Jesus. And it's through his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to our morning service on Sunday, April 19th. I will be reading from Psalm 97, verses 1 through 5. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. Good morning, my name is Ren Marsh and I'll be doing the prayer this morning. Please pray with me. Thank you God for everything you bless us with and thank you for our first responders, doctors, nurses, grocery store workers, other and other essential workers that have been helping us survive this crisis. Pray for our leaders and help them make wise decisions. Also, may you pray for those who have lost their jobs during this time. May you pray that the virus passes quickly and that we can return to normal. Also, pray for students and teachers who are no longer in school and have to adjust. Pray for those at Westbury who have been personally affected by the virus. And thank you for giving us an opportunity to spend time with loved ones, even in a rough time. We look forward to come back to church safely and worship you. And we pray all these things in Son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Over all the earth you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams 
In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart, draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, O oh, fold me, close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine. Sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp and its pride, give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Hi, the scripture reading for today is James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now, this verse tells us to do two different things. The first thing is to submit ourselves to God. And whenever we do this, we are coming near to God and saying that we're wanting to follow God. And whenever we do that, he will come near to us. And the second thing 
is to humble ourselves before the Lord. Whenever we humble ourselves to the Lord, we're putting God first instead of our own selves. And whenever we do that, God will lift us up. And so just as we start this week, uh, just remember to submit yourselves to God and humble yourselves to God so that way uh, you can grow closer to him and that he can lift you up. Let's pray for the bread. Uh, Father, thank you so much that we're able to come today and, and worship and honor you and have communion. And uh, we're grateful that we can be with our families and, and do this. Uh, Father, we thank you for the the sacrifice that Jesus made, his death on the cross, and just what this is symbolizing. Uh, Father, help us to, to always remember to bring glory and honor to you. And thank you for Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Father, we thank you for Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross and just the salvation that comes through all of this. Father, help us to use this week as a week to get closer to you. Uh, help us to use every week as a week to get closer to you. Uh, help us to encourage one another. Help us to, to spread your love and to tell others about you in some way. Um, thank you for Jesus' death, burial, and his resurrection and just be with us as we're going through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Now is the time when we traditionally take an offering, and on the screen are some ways that you can give here to Westbury. Um, help us to always have a cheerful heart and a grateful heart and help us to just encourage others and do things that will help the kingdom. And here at Westbury, we are striving to do that. And just let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you so much for all the many people who just give so freely. And we're so grateful for that. Help us to just have that cheerful heart. Father, all of us have, have things that we that we think about and help us to think about you and how we can, can help further your kingdom. And it's in your sins that we pray. Amen. Purer in heart, O oh God, help me to be. May I devote my life wholly Guide me with counsel sweet, pure in heart, help me to be pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be. Teach me to do thy will most lovingly. Be thou my friend and guide. Let me with thee abide. Pure in heart. Help me to be pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be that I thy holy face one day may see. Keep me from sin. Secret sin, reign thou my soul within, pure in heart, help me to be. Good morning.
morning. I am coming to you today from in my office. Uh, the uh, auditorium is being used for something else. And, uh, and so I just kind of slipped back in here in my office. And, uh, and so we'll see. Uh, but good morning. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, welcome to Westbury Church of Christ. I love having you here. We're, we're in a series that we're calling uh, Living in the New Norm. And because this post-pandemic, actually we're mid-pandemic, but after it's all over, uh, there are going to be some different things out there. There are, Anytime uh, we have big changes, there are different things. I think the closest thing this comes to in my lifetime would be right after 9-11 and all the changes that took place then that it took us a while to get used to. Uh, but nonetheless, we incorporate it into our everyday lives and, and so will be for this. Uh, and so, so come along with us as we look through the new norm. Now, I want to talk about how all the th new restrictions that will be on us, how we can find joy from the inside out, because from the outside in, all we hear about is this, all the new things we've got to do. We've got to stay inside. Now, I don't know about you, but I love soap. I, I love different kinds of soap. I, you know, I'm not a stick with one kind of soap person. I like Amazon.com was made for me when it comes to soap because you can buy all these different kinds out there. And uh, and so especially now that you have to wash your hands eight or 10 times a day, uh, I, I want to wash it with Dial one time and Irish Spring with another time and Dove another time. And and uh, and uh, I got some lava uh, soap. And uh, now that is a man soap, lava soap. You, I've dimed down to about the third layer of skin that I've got left. Uh, after I after I wash with lava, it gets it clean and germs are scared of that. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's because right now in America, or actually across the whole world, we're obsessed with pure. We want pure. We, we you know, we, we, we don't want contaminated, especially with the virus that's all going around. And, and so we as a people are obsessed with purity. Uh, we want to drink pure water. We want to breathe pure air. We want to eat food that's not contaminated with pesticides and, and genetic modification. So I did a little research for us uh, on that. I am your full service preacher. Did you know that Americans spend $16 billion dollars a year on bottled water. 16 billion, that's with a B, on bottled water. Uh, we spend $22 billion a year on filtered air. Usually that filtered air is attached to an air conditioner. Uh, and so in Houston, you, you need one of those or else you're going to sweat it out. Uh, and so, uh, but, but breathing clean air is important to us. So filtered air, $22 billion. Uh, 2016 was the latest data I could find available uh, for eating foods that is, what it, that is what is certified as organic which means it doesn't have all the stuff that, that, that is put in there. And we spent $44 billion in 2016 on organic foods. Now, listen, I am not going to doubt for one minute that clean air and pure water and pure food are important. But there is a sense of purity that we as Americans tend to overlook. Welcome to the new norm, because pure is going to take on a whole new framework within our within our world as we're going to take more and more time and effort to disinfect and do that. So come with me and let's read Matthew chapter five, verse eight. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You see, we could eat pure food and drink pure water and breathe pure air. But if we don't have a pure heart, we really don't have much. So happiness is a heart condition. It's really not what is inside of us. It's what comes out of us. Blessing comes from the inside out. So that's what a pure heart is. Now, a pure heart comes when we have unmixed motives. You see, when we have unmixed motives, we are people of integrity. People of integrity don't say one thing and, and mean another thing. They don't act one way or don't say they're going to act some way and then turn around, turn around and act another way. Now, their motives are true. You see, God's concerned with why we do things as much as he's concerned with what we do. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Be careful not to parade your good deeds before others to attract their notice, or you will lose all your reward 
from your father in heaven. Now, is, is it possible to do good things with bad motives? Absolutely, it's possible to do good things with bad motives. It is possible to be outwardly religious and inwardly a mess. You see, Jesus says true happiness comes when the outside's the same as the inside. It comes when we are people of integrity. In fact, it's so important that he spends the entirety of chapter six of the book of Matthew on this. So let me give you three steps. While we're drinking pure water and eating pure food and breathing pure air, let me give you three steps to have a pure heart so that when we come out of, the, when we come out of our homes, that the new norm actually makes a difference to our world. So number one is this. I want you to remember that God sees everything. The key phrase in Matthew 6 is, your father sees what is done in secret. All right, so that means nothing ever surprises God. Does it bother you that God sees everything, that you have no secrets from God? Does it bother you? Because sometimes it bothers me. It bothers me because there are some things that go on in my heart that I would really rather God not look at. But he knows everything about me. I mean, I, 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 it amazes me that there are people who really think they're fooling God. You know, and, and here's the thing, here's the, man, the crafty thing about the devil, because the devil whispers to you, go ahead, nobody will ever find out. And the reality is, oh, somebody already knows. The Bible says nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered in the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And if God already knows everything, I may as well have a pure heart as to try and fake a pure heart. That I may fool you, but I can't fool God. Now, the amazing thing is God knows everything I'm going to do and everything I've done, but he still chooses to love me anyway. So that's number one. Number two is this. I need to remove, I need to review my motives, which means I need to do an honest evaluation of why I do what I do. Proverbs 24, 21. It says, God knows and judges your motives. God keeps watch over us. He knows and he, re he rewards us according to what we do. Now, if you have your Bible with you, and I hope you do, I want you to circle motive and rewards. Because he says our, our reward is based not just on what we do, but why we do what we do. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives us three examples. He gives giving, praying, and fasting that we can do, but we can also do them in the wrong way. And he starts with giving, verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and on the streets to be honored my men. I'll tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. He says when you give, you shouldn't give in order to be seen by other people and in order to be told you're doing a good job. Look, I visited a church one time, uh, and, and it wasn't a church of Christ, but I visited a church. It was on a tour. I visited a church one time where every furnishing, every pew, every pulpit, every bathroom, every seat had somebody's name on it. Everything had as a gift, uh, donated as a gift from or given. There, there, everything. Now look, folks, there's nothing wrong with mem memorials, but these guys were still alive. There was nobody dead in there. Everybody was still alive. Everything in that church had somebody's name on it, and they were living memorials. And that was a little trumpet to, oh, here's what I gave. It says, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, then your father who sees what is done in secret rewards you. He says, when you give, when you decide to do something, don't even talk to yourself when you do that. I get, I have to say, I get tickled. I have to laugh at some of our, our big superstars, our big, uh, our big um, athletic superstars, because man, they can't give, they can't give a pair of shoes away without having eight cameras and four PR people telling everybody in the world how awesome they are for giving a, a pair of shoes away to somebody. And, and so he said, so don't do that. Number, number, You can give, and that's wonderful, but you can do it with the wrong motives. Number two, he says, is pray. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing up in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you, they've already received their full reward. 
Now, look, you don't have to be in church very long before you find somebody in there that's good that's praying to, that's good that's good at praying to the crowd. I mean, that, they'll do these real flowery prayers, and when they're done, you feel like you need to clap. Uh, you've just seen a performance, and and you, and let me just give you some signs of that when you find somebody. Uh, reminding God of something that God already knows to tell the other people that are listening. Sometimes preachers do that. And the Lord help us to remember that Thursday night at seven o'clock, there's a deacon's meeting at our house uh, on that. Jesus says, that's not being pure in heart. You know, when, when you remind when you remind God of where things are in the Bible, Lord, we remember in, in Exodus chapter two, when you said, and God remembers it, he's the one that put it there. He says, when you pray, you're not there to impress people with your knowledge. And then fasting, verse 17. He says, look, when you fast, don't go around looking hungry so people will know that you're fasting. He says, wash your face, put a little oil on your head so it won't be obvious to people that you're fasting. So what's the point of all these things? You know, what's what's the point? And Jesus is saying that the point of a pure heart is if you do good, you don't have to broadcast it. In fact, if you can't do good without broadcasting it, maybe your motives are mixed. Maybe you want the praise of people more than you want the praise of God. And so the test of a pure heart is, can I do this thing and not tell anybody? Or do I feel like I have to go blab it every time? You know, if you decide to spend a night praying, can you keep it secret? And it's interesting that in those three examples, the ones that can't do it without letting everybody know, he calls them hypocrites, all right? And he says, listen, this group called the Pharisees, they love the flattery of people a whole lot better than the praise of God. And that's what they get. They've, that's all the reward they're going to get. Somebody coming up and going, you're really holy. That's what. That's all they're going to get. First Thessalonians 2, 4. We do not aim to please others, but to please God who knows us through and through. So we have to ask ourselves the question, as we prepare for the new norm, who, it is, who is it important that we please the most? Who's the condition of our heart? Or what is the condition of our heart? You see, if we want to praise other people, okay, we can, but that's all the reward we're going to get. You see, God remembers and God knows everything we do. So when it comes to this, we can't fake it. Or as those great theologians, the young radicals say, uh, or the new radicals say, yeah, you know, you only get what you give. And, and, and so, you know, I had somebody say, well, hang on, you know, Yasko, you're a preacher at a pretty good sized church and people see you all the time. I bet it's hard to be you in public. You know, it really is not hard to be people to be in my, to be me in public. Okay, uh, okay. It, you know, I, it's one of these things where I just go, here I am. I, I am. I am me twenty four seven. Phoniness is unhappiness, and I, I am not, by and large, an unhappy person. And happy people are the ones that go, here it is. This is the way it goes. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. It does mean I'm honest. It does mean I'm transparent. You know, sometimes I have to dial it back a little bit. Sometimes my mouth tends to get me in trouble because I've, I'm passionate about some things and I don't hide them. And sometimes I need to do better at that. But you're not going to get somebody who's a fake. Number three, if I want a pure heart, I need to realign my priorities. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. The Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. God says, you know what? When it comes to whatever it is important in your life, I want top spot. I, I, I'm, I am not going to play second fiddle to anybody. I don't want rivals. I don't want to fight with your career. I don't want to fight with your husband. I don't want to fight with your wife. I want first place. All right. What's a God? What's an idol? Anything that wants first place in your life. So how do I know what my priorities are? Let me give you three tests. Three tests of what your priorities are. Number one, test number one is this. Look at your activities. What do you invest your money and your time in? The Bible says, don't pile up treasures on earth. Keep your treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there's where your heart will be also. So I want you to circle your heart in that passage of scripture. Because wherever you put your investment, 
That's your time and your money. All right. That's wherever you put your investment. That's where you're finding. That's where you're going to find your heart. Uh, all right. So I can ask, what's first place in your life? And you can tell me, oh, the Lord's first place in my life. I'm, I love God more than anything and, and that. But if you'll let me look in your checkbook, and if you'll let me look in your bank statement, and if you'll let me look at your calendar in your, in your iPad or in your iPhone, then I'll really be able to see what's first place in your life. See, regardless of where we say is first or what we say is first, where we spend our time and our money, that determines what's first place in our life. That's why the purpose of giving is to teach us what God put first place in our lives. You see, when I give money back to God, I remember that it all comes from God in the first place. I give them the first part of the day, the first part of my money, the first part of every week. I give that to God. God is first. Now, you know, here's the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here today and I'm in front of this iBook, this MacBook, and I'm doing this lesson. Do you know where I'm going to be Sunday morning? I'm going to be at services and I'm going to be listening to me speak because it is a worship time. I'm not going to be, you know, I've been there. I've done that. I've recorded it. I'm going to go play tennis. I'm not because God gets the first part of the first day of the week. I like to listen to three or four different people on Sunday morning. This affords me the chance to do that. And so God's first. And then the second thing that you do on, on testing what your priorities are, are look at my anxieties. All right, look at my activities. Number two, look at my anxieties. Now, now that's simply, what do I worry about the most? See, you can tell a lot about somebody by what they worry about. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Now, you look all the way through the book of Matthew. In fact, you look, let me just, no, let's narrow that down a little bit. You look all the way through Matthew chapter six and the five most common worries of life are dealt with in this chapter. They're dealt with in Matthew chapter six. Here we go. Verse 24, finances. Verse 25, food. Verse 27, fitness. Verse 28, fashion. Verse 34, future. Those five things are all dealt, are all dealt with in this passage of scripture. And if you worry about any of those things, it means God's not number one in your life. It means your priorities aren't where they should be. So check out your activities and then check out your anxieties. And worry indicates there's a wrong priority. Worry says, God, I'm in charge, not you. You know, that means if I'm worried about my finances, I'm not trusting God. That means if I'm worrying about my fashion, I'm, I'm not trusting God. The Bible says, don't worry about your clothes. He says, I want you to check these things to see if your motives are right. And then the third thing you do is you look at your ambitions because my goals reveal the direction of my heart. So whatever is our number one goal in life, our number one ambition in life, whatever is important to me, number one, then that's my God. Now, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. I like, this is J.B. Phillips. I like this. Don't worry about these things. This is what pagans are always looking for. Your heavenly father knows you need them. Instead, set your heart first on his kingdom and his goodness, and all these things will come to you as a matter of course. Okay, that little phrase in that, in that translation, always looking for. These are the things they're always looking for. That's ambition. Now, a lot of the problems that we bring upon ourselves is that our ambitions are exactly the same as the unbeliever's ambition. There's no difference that a lot of us have bought into the same culture as the unbeliever. And as a result, the same tension exists in our life that exists in the unbeliever's life. The same stress, the same headaches, the same problems. And God says, you want to break that? Okay, set your art first on doing what God wants you to do, and all these other things will be brought in as a matter of choice. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So let's define pure in heart. It means I am continually conscious of God's presence 24-7. 
I am, I am conscious that God is there. That's a mark of maturity. You see, the more mature we are, the more conscious we are that God's with us all the time and the less conscious we are of other people around us. So when I'm doing good, then I am conscious of God and less conscious of what anybody else does. Whereas the other immature person is more worried about the people around me than I am about God. You know, an, an immature person says, I, I wonder if they're going to like this prayer. A mature person says, yeah, I just want to please God. You see, the desire of every believer's heart is to be a pleasure to God. That's what it means to be pure in heart. You see, happiness boils down to simply, who do you want to please in your life? Because you can't please everybody, but you can please God. And if I please God, then I know I'm pleasing the right person. And that makes life a whole lot more simple. You see, a pure in heart person is content with God's praise. He says, look, she says, look, I am content with the rewards of God, not the praise of a person. The, the people who are the biggest givers usually aren't the most show-offy. I have been doing this a long time, and, and it's interesting. The people who are the most show-offy are the ones who hardly ever give. You know, the ones that, the, the ones that make the biggest show of giving are the ones that very rarely give. And, and so, a, a, so a pure-in-heart person is content with God being the only one that knows. And then a pure in heart person is controlled by God's priorities. You see, they have their heart set on what God thinks is important. So what's the result? What's the result? I mean, if I start trying to be an honest, transparent person, if I start being a person of integrity and don't have double motives, what are the results? Well, let me just give you one main result. And we're really going to need this in the new norm because there's going to be a lot of dissatisfaction in the new normal. So here's the result. Happiness. Happiness is the result. Blessed. Happy are the pure in heart. Here's why. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to be a phony. You don't have to pretend. Unfortunately, the opposite is always true, is also true. Unhappy are those with the mixed motives. Unhappy are the divided hearts. Unhappy are those who are trying to please everybody. You see, we've got folks that are trying to please a whole bunch of people who want a whole bunch of different things, and you're divided about doing that, and you're miserable. Look, look happiness is when you don't have any fear of being found out. Here's why. Because we will see God. You know, those that don't have a mixed motive in their life live for God no matter what. And as a result, we get to see God no matter what. It's the difference between having clean glasses on and dirty glasses on, okay? You're going to see better if you have clean glasses. I, I wear glasses. I, I don't like to wear them much because they I can see better with them, but they bother me. They bother my nose, they bother my ears, they bother all sorts of things. But from time to time, my eyes get tired, especially when I'm driving, and so I put them on. And I keep them down um, in my console. And normally when I pull them out, oh my goodness, they're dirty. And so I keep a, a cleaning, I, I keep one of those things that you clean your glasses with in there. And so I clean them off, and it's amazing what you can see when your glasses are clean. Okay, and so uh, and so, it's, it's, so the difference between being able to see out of your glasses or not are whether they're clean or not. All right, let me draw a parallel with that. All right, you know, so we can't see God when we have a dirty heart. No, no, no. The same thing applies. It's like trying to look through a pair of dirty glasses. We we've got to have a clean heart in order to see God. So how do we get a clean heart? Well, we can't do it by ourselves. If we could do it by ourselves, there'd have been no need for Jesus to have died on the cross. David in Psalm chapter 51 had the most shattering experience of his life. You know, I mean, he, 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 he let his emotions get out of control and he committed adultery with another man's wife, and then he had that man killed, and he had to walk around with the fact that he was a murderer and an adulterer. 
And it all gathered to him, and he and, and he, it, he felt absolutely miserable, like there was no redemption. And he prayed this simple prayer. He said, oh, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Because he couldn't see God with a dirty heart. And God cleaned his heart for him by giving him the right thoughts and the right desires. Now, there was a David part and there was a God part. I would suggest as you get ready for the new norms to start by cleaning your glasses and while you're cleaning, clean your heart. It's going to help you see God a whole lot better. It's going to help you see us a whole lot better. It's going to help you see the things you need to see in order to react to what life's going to be a whole lot better. And that means be restored. Restoring is a furniture term. It means taking all of the dirt and the grime and the clutter off of a piece of furniture all of the old varnish, all of the old stuff that got stuck on there and applying a solution that melts all that away so you just have pure, clean wood. Oh, you can feel it. I like to refurnish furniture. I like to, re I like to refinish it. And, and when, that, when everything's off of it and you got it sanded down, it just, oh, it just feels good. You just know how it's just smooth and like our hearts when we dust them off and clean them up and wipe all the dirt off of them and give them to God and God cleans them up for us and gives us back to them and gives them back to us. Maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need your starting point. Maybe, man, maybe you need the deluxe treatment where you give your heart to God and you are clean. And I would ask you to do that today. Call me, 832-259-2681, if you don't know what you need to do to be baptized. And we'll walk through that together. Or send me a text. Ask me to pray for you if you need to be restored. Or if you want a place of membership, <clears throat> we're here for that too. But don't let this moment pass. You do not leave and walk into the new norm with a dirty heart when a clean heart is right here. That's the invitation. And may God bless you. And Jesus give you all kinds of peace. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, to see you shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. To see you shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. 
holy, holy, holy. You are holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Good morning, church family. To the visitors, I am Wendell Van Smith, one of the elders here at Westbury Church of Christ. We want to thank you for sharing your Sunday morning with us. It is important that you know how much we appreciate your attendance and look forward to you meeting with us in person at the appointed time. Just know, as do our members, that we are here to share Christ, grow in his word, show his love, and connect with you. Recognizing our goal, we thank you, our visitors, and those of our members who are joining us this morning. We want to thank the participants who put this service together. We certainly want to thank our minister, Brother David Yasko, and our song leader, Brother Colin Elk, and those who have uh, assisted, uh, be their prayers, their song service. Uh, there are some of us who are reaching out to our kids' ministry. We want to serve all of our family, even in this time. At this point, we would like to bring your attention to some of those who are in need of prayer. Justin Leach has recently left the hospital and he's had some lung conditions that, and he's improving. Sister Bernice Lewis had a fall and uh, she's doing better. We also have good news on Joanne Clack. She's had two tests from what we understand where she's been found negative for the coronavirus for which she had previously suffered. We want to continue our prayers for Joyce Green, who lost her husband, brother Abraham Green. And also, we want to keep Miriam Hartz in our prayers, along with uh, the mother of uh, Michelle Burrell, Sarah Holton, and Michelle's brother, Mark Finn. And also, let us keep Lauren Green, the daughter of Carol Green, and the granddaughter of Alice Collins in our prayers. We thank you so much for being here with us. And if you will, go with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our God. We love you, Lord. And recognizing that this pandemic is upon us and all of the nation is aware of what is going on. You've got their attention, Lord. And we recognize that it is you that is in control of this entire world. So we start from our families, our communities, our nation, and our world on our knees, praying to you that we recognize you as our God and that only you can save us. We thank you for the mercy you've given us and we ask for your continued grace over us. Lord, we want to reach out to this community in a way that will bring them unto us. We know that by the heart, the love that we share with one another and the lights that shine inside and out, that we will bring Christ unto this world and they will see who is in charge. They will recognize that you are our God and we won't be fearful, Lord. We won't be anxious, but yet we must be smart. We must protect our families. We must protect our community. We must protect this nation. So we pray for our leaders that they do the right thing in protecting this family from ourselves. No, Lord, we know that you are in charge, but we also know that you've given us knowledge and wisdom that we must use to be smart and to live this life and to love one another, protect one another. And we thank you 
for what you've done for us because we cannot make it on our own. So we look to you ultimately as we try to bring others unto this church that we join with one another in fellowship and show that love each and every day as we walk your way. Let your light shine upon us. Continue to shine so that we may bring others. And let this time be a time that we get to know one another. Lord, we look so forward to being back together again in normalcy. We ask that you do this for us. In your son's Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.